Good afternoon. Is the microphone working? Yes. Um, I want to have a session which is meant to be interactive. I will give a very short introduction, mostly repeating what I said in my keynote to get the picture a bit about the organization behind it. Uh, I'm the chairman of Blender Foundation. I'm also the director of Blender Institute. Uh, that means that I have a lot of responsibilities and many different hats. So uh, I will try to be uh, in the right responsible position, depending on the questions I get. But I would especially like to hear from you guys, like, what do you expect from the organization, or what can the organization do better, either whether that's the Blender Foundation or Blender Institute. The main thing people really should know and realize that Blender is not being made by the Blender Foundation or the Blender Institute. The Blender is made at Blender.org. The people who are part of the Blender.org community, whether that's coders or scripters or documenters or website makers or whoever helps us, that's a community, it's an open community of people, the hundreds of people, they are the teams who make Blender possible. We work with module teams, we call that. It's a little patch of Blender where you can become a team member or you can come become an owner of the module. That means you have responsibilities and you have some uh, freedom to make decisions. You can find all that information on the Get Involved at uh, Blender.org. But there's also two other organizations, and that is uh, the Blender Foundation and Blender Institute. The foundation was started in 2002 to help with the, uh, uh, the campaign to get the Blender sources released as a GNU CPL. And since then, the foundation has remained active as like mainly a safe, uh, a, plain, a thing with a door where you can lock your IP and your donations. It's a safe place for Blender to make sure that there is always a future. You don't want to have Blender being put back in some kind of risky business like it was before. Nobody can buy Blender. I mean, you're not even the IP from the Blender Foundation, because that's, the Blender Foundation is not for sale. It's that legally you cannot sell a foundation even. And even when I would become crazy and start selling stuff, you can bring me to court because the Blender Foundation has statutes which say our, our public goals and public interest. We have to act in that sense. I can't simply say, oh, I'm going to support Autodesk uh, from now on, and then you can't. Then you can bring me to court and I will most certainly lose this. <laughs> Plus, what people don't know maybe, but the Blender code is not owned by the Blender Foundation. <laughs> What? <laughs> that was Autodesk. That has been live on the internet. crap about Blender Foundation. Hmm? So even uh, if so even if you would want to, uh, the code of the uh, Blender is owned by the developers. Every developer who contributes can say, I keep it, my copyright, and I will bring it as 
GPR into Blender. So this Blender Foundation and Blender is continuity, it's safe, but I also want to do some risky stuff. Uh, I'm a businessman, I like to do crazy things. I don't like to make a lot of money, but I do like to have fun and do the things I like to do. So you have to make some money to be able to do that. And that's why I started uh, to a Blender Institute in 2007, which is <laughs> looking, which is the place where we made Big Bug Bunny and Sintel and Joe Frankie and the Tears of Steel and the Gooseberry Project and Cameron Anders. We are doing training when we do the book publishing. We do all the stuff in Blender Institute to make sure there is a healthy continuous income to support Blender projects, to support myself, to support the websites and everything we do. So those two organizations are of course very important for Blender, but I don't want people to think that this is the only way things happen. There are many ways you can make stuff happen, but I do understand the responsibility because if we have we, the Blender for Institute, which, uh, when I define that we want to do a, a new film project and we have a number of targets which we want to work on, then those things might likely happen. I'm in a luxury position because all the developers and the artists, they say, ooh, ah, I want to work with you guys, I want to come to Amsterdam. So I have a bit of a benefit compared to like the NPR people who are sitting there, yeah, well, nobody's listening to me, I have great ideas, but why is it not happening? I know I have to be responsible for this. We only work on targets which I believe in is in the best benefit of everybody and in the best benefit of Blender itself. The Blender has to stay a really good, professional, high-quality 3D creation suite. That's what we work on. <coughs> now, mostly I would like to get some feedback or questions from the audience about what we do. for the future, yeah. Um, the, uh, the Blender Institute, that's what I also mentioned in my keynote, there's some slides here. The, so the Blender Institute is changing a little bit in plans, what we do. I want to have more continuity. That means we will do projects, and we might even explore to do a commercial film, but we want to be an open source studio, more than only a, a place where we do open movie projects, and then send everybody home, and then do another project. I think that continuity is important for us to be able to grow, and to get really the best people in the world to work with us and with Unblender. The foundation has no plans, apart from making sure that all the facilities will be perfectly working for everybody. But it's an open system. Yeah. Uh, what I found kind of amazing uh, at the talk yesterday from Francesco and Pablo was that they were like um, very much with the Blender ID tying together all the services, so Blender Network and Blender Certified Trainers and all that. I was wondering if that is like uh, an outspoken strategy from the foundation or from people at the institute, or if, it, if it's just happening, because it, it seems very uh, centralized in a way. I'm, I'm yeah. not saying this now in a bad way, but uh, yeah. Well, the, it, it's, you're right. I, the Blender ID is not meant to be some kind of a, a evil a Google over thing that everybody has to get it, otherwise you can't use Blender. But we do have the problem that the Blender dot uh, org website, I mean, we have a whole rack of servers, and they are running like 20 or 30 websites already. They have all the blogs and all the things and all the websites and the developer stuff and the wiki stuff and the, the network and, and name everything, but that's too complicated. 
So the proposal was to simplify that a bit and make sure that if you are locked in once, like to buy a conference ticket or to subscribe to be a speaker or to have you join us in the cloud or when you do a donation or the development fund, all those things that you only have to remember your password once and then you are locked in. That's all. That's a blender.org login facilitator. That's it. But you never know what might happen. I mean, there's people who want to have a secure blender files or you want to be able to sign things. Well, security is a problem. It's really, you have this crappy feature in Blender that you have to click in the header if you want to have a, a non-secure blend file to work, huh? which is still something we have to fix. Did, did Daniel kick you for that for every day? <laughs> and is there a solution? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And the solution was that he agrees with you? Oh. <laughs> anyway, so but that's the uh, I forgot what I was talking about. Yeah. You first, thank you. Um, do you publish the balance sheet of the Blender Foundation, like the revenues and spendings and where the money came from and how it was spent? We should. I know we should. There's nothing to hide. The Blender Foundation uh, revenues is, uh, should be public. I did it once or twice and then I kept forgetting. And nobody asked me about it, so I was like, oh, who cares? So we, we do have a public... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the development fund income is public. You can see the, the, the statistic for what's coming in monthly. Um, but what I have a little bit of a problem with is publishing exactly what we pay or what kind of support we give to developers. But I think that's really privacy information. Like if a developer works for 20 cents per day or for 2,000 euros per day, that is something that's between me and the developer, right? So we don't post that kind of information. But all together, uh, we should do that. I tried to even for this talk to get this information, but it's, uh, yeah, you have to remind me. You send me an email and I will do it. What? But is there any question you have? I can tell you, I, I know the numbers a bit. You want to know how many millions we are making? <laughs> we don't. No. But. Uh, I think the total. <coughs> uh, I, I think it was uh, 120,000 or so, 150 between that for last year. In this all donation income, donation and development fund and uh, gifts and smaller things. And the institute, in average, between 400 and 700,000 in euros. But that's like in dollars a little bit. Just a uh, very specific question about uh, Blender ID, uh, which is awesome, but uh, uh, would it be possible such that this Blender ID also works for mailing lists? Like, I have subs uh, subscribed, uh, subscribed like seven mailing lists and I have seven passwords, I don't remember them. So it would also be awesome if it was linked to the Blender ID. Uh, that's a good point. I have no idea. <laughs> but the, the, the whole list system is run by a software called Mailman. Uh, Mailman has their own ideas about passwords. Uh, it's not very secure even, but Mailman will email you passwords. And I don't like systems that email passwords all the time. It's not very secure either. So it's a bit like the same is for the developer uh, login. If you want to be able to commit on the Blender code, that's also not the Blender ID. It's still a separate system. So sometimes it's better to keep it separate, but you're right. We will try to get as much as possible in one uh, login system. Hey, so yesterday you talked about uh, Blender default. Hopefully I got it right. Uh, that there should be some like default setting, for example, for, uh, I don't know, uh, VFX, uh, guys or um, maybe even like game developers uh, is there any plan already or project or roadmap for this? Well, the, I mentioned it in, uh, in some talks 
what I believe in personal, but we have more developers, is that we should support workflows better. And we have to stop making a single default which fits everybody, because then it's far too big. There is no way you can find an empty shortcut. And if somebody invents the sticky key, they suddenly say, oh, let's do, do, use it immediate, and then nobody can configure their own sticky key suddenly. So we have to stream it down and make it easier for people to say, okay, so the default, I believe, should be really, really small, hardly anything. The minimum, minimum, minimum thing we all agree on that you should be able to have to be able to demo Blender from scratch. But the further, you add your own key maps and own configurations on top of that. But as I said, uh, this talk is not about Blender, because Blender Foundation and Blender Institute is not making Blender. This is not about making Blender, this is about facilitating teams to be able to make Blender. So. I, um, I'm really interested about the Monka projects, uh, and uh, I would like to know um, uh, how the Blender Institute intend to help uh, external uh, studios and teams to, to create film and uh, so you said it, it would, uh, it's a uh, aim for the Blender Institute but uh, how do you have an idea of how, um, how we can for example uh, apply for uh, a movie or stuff like that? I mean I think people people have been uh, trying to do crowdfunding for film a lot and in general it works really bad really difficult as an independent filmmaker, as an animator, or even our games is getting better, but for film, if you want to get your money, then how much do you get? I think Tube might be the biggest, with like 30000 or something in the end, $40,000, and for the rest, it goes down to 15, 10, or 5, which is not a lot, right? It's a difficult issue, but that's why... When I was contacted by the team in India with their open movie project, they wanted to do a crowdfunding tour. They said, ah, oh, we have a DVD, ah, pre-sale. They wanted to copy the same system as we've been doing. But then when, when I was looking at it and talking with them about it, they also agreed that they probably would not get that much sales, right? It might sell 200 or 100 because they don't, they're not known and nobody knows them, so why would you give them money? And is it reliable? Do you actually get the DVD or not? So those kind of issues are uh, important. So on the other hand, the Blender Institute is also not really doing crowdfunders anymore. We decided to do a more permanent subscription system. So we try to get our loyal supporters who really like the projects we do to say, okay, I will pay a little bit per month, and for that money, I want you guys to do awesome stuff, like making film, testing things, hiring Blender developers, and really help bringing Blender further. And if that fund gets big enough, we can also support other projects. So I, I thought it would be a good idea to test it first with the Wybeck guys in India. So they have their film in the Blender cloud. Uh, it has to be open, open content, and uh, creative commons. Uh, it has to be done with Blender, of course. And then we will see how that works. And if a lot of people appreciate it, if we get good feedback from the users there, we can try other projects. And so if you have projects, you can talk to me about it. But for the time being, we can't do that every week or so. Uh, we also don't have a lot of money for that. Yeah? Hi. Are you planning to make some training series again at the Blender Institute? And if you're not, why? So you do mean training in Blender Institute? Now we did that uh, a lot, but it was mostly in between the film projects. And we didn't have a lot of people working there on the film, so we could use the studio to do the training. And at the moment, the studio is full, so there's no space for a training. That's why it hasn't been planned. And I really think there is need for it. There's a lot of need for a training. But this is a business opportunity I would like to uh, share with everybody. I mean, training is business. You got paid for it. It's not that bad to do, right? Some people really like it even. I get a lot. But, uh, <laughs> some people really like to, to help and to train and to explain uh, how Blender works. So do it. And uh, make publicity or mail me that we can help you uh, making PR that you can be found as a training institute or as a certified trainer or on the Blender Network.
How do you become a certified trainer? Uh, you go to blender.org and there is a education slash certification. Slash certification. Uh, Pablo um, and Francesco are handling the certification too. So you can talk to them a little bit to learn a little bit more. But this is a complete online system. There's no physical need to do things. You can go through the whole process uh, by submitting your material and some evidence that you actively know Blender and stuff like that. And after that, you are uh, supposed to have a freelance subscription at the Blender Network, which then will be tagged as a certified runner so people can find you. That's the idea. Um, don't you think that with this certified trainer that uh, I bet the community starts to close? Now, now Blender is an open source uh, software and it's uh, open to discussions about the techniques online. And uh, many people get their information from the uh, an artist, for example. So uh, when now this uh, professional training is starting or even deliver, develops more, don't you see that it's uh, a bit of uh, uh, counteracting? Uh, you mean whether the certifications would work against the openness or against the open community where everybody can uh, participate? Yes, but I mean, that's two. I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, a certification doesn't mean anything that you are qualified or good, or it's not a quality thing. It is simply a business uh, facilitator for trainers who need it. Because many times, as, uh, institutions or uh, governments, they want to see that paper. They want to see, oh, I'm officially certified by the Blender Foundation to get this. That's all. It's not for selling themselves to you or to other people. It's not meant to be that way. So if you are certified, only means that you are a serious person who wants to get into training paid by institutions or governments. That's all. So all the other things, like how, what do you have to know? Like you have to know all the 1,000 atoms and 5,000 uh, blended fluid and particle features and all that stuff. We don't really bother with that. And that would be also good to have like training online where people can go through steps that they say, okay, I can get a modeling badge or a, a simulation badge or an animation rigging uh, badge or whatever you call those things. So some kind of a standardized training. That's what I really would like to see happen. But that's a lot of work and we don't have people on board who are into this and who know how to make it. I just, just mean the effort of uh, many people go more in this uh, paid training system or more in the public available documentation system. This is, uh, this is the, po the point I mean. Well, the, the, the public documentation system is a talk to this afternoon, uh, at two. There will be a documentation session to talk about that. And uh, for the Blender Foundation, uh, it's essential to support good public free documentation on the wiki and on other systems which is available for everybody to use or to put in books or do whatever you like with it. Um, hello there. Um, during the whole conference uh, we saw many special uh, implementations of Blender to different uh, fields. Uh, either were scientific, either they were industrial, um, shouldn't we gather all these people uh, either to a thread, either to a forum section, either to somewhere, even in this conference, could we make um, a, a small meeting about the application specialists of Blender? Uh, for instance, somebody uses Blender to, for CNC engineering, somebody uses for 3D printing, another one who finds uh, an application for Blender that's used in um, any visualization effects in chemistry, in research. All these people come uh, mainly f either from research facilities, either from uh, industry. So um, these meetings might prove uh, 
a very good status or basis for people who, that are searching there are blender um, uh, developers or they are graphic artists and they're basically looking for a job or they are uh, they were left out of their business because they you don't know their the job opportunity they had before uh, is poor so uh, that meeting could go uh, could be um, a solution to their problem because they will fill them with ideas of what's going on in the world in uh, Blender applications. Also, the people that are in there, they can combine uh, some skills and uh, not be searching for one another. So they can make also new opportunities. What do you think about that, Tom? I think the, the Blender conference is actively a meeting for professionals and researchers and users of Blender and developers to make sure there is interaction and we do things together, right? But there's no formal other session. Like uh, yesterday, I think from our uh, Render Street, we had we were wanted to probably to share it. But a lot of companies have issues with getting into the market because Blender is not very well established as a support system, for example. Because the company says, "Yeah, we have a Blender bug," and then they start blaming the Render Farm. Right? And then the, the Render guy says, yeah, but it's not our problem, it's, uh, it's the, their problem, or it's Blender's problem. There is no real infrastructure in the Blender community, or in the Blender uh, e ecosystem, where you can hire professional support. Although sometimes it pops up, but it disappears a bit. And we should have that more visible. So maybe that's also what you mean, so you might uh, want to talk more to the professionals in the community and make sure that they know the needs and they know how to uh, work together to find out uh, business together that they can help out and become a very nice and fruitful company. What? I just wanted to say that we're not pointing fingers at Blender. We're trying to solve the problem first and then point the fingers at Blender. But uh, <laughs> this is, no, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But the, the question is, who should be responsible to, for developing the ecosystem around Blender? Because what's, what's happening is that, as I told you yesterday, there are people coming up as, as more professionals start using Blender. There are people, up, people coming up that are not quite part of the community. So they don't know how to come on IRC or how to submit a bug on the, on the developer side. So, uh, in my opinion, there should be some, somebody concerned and focusing on developing the community. And the question is, who would that be? Uh, I, I hope that the uh, Blender Network would help with that. So, to Blender Network, the BlenderNetwork.org, you know Blender Network? Okay. This is uh, meant to bring the professionals together, and you should kick them to say, wow, well, we want to have a forum or a mailing list. Is there a list? Uh, hmm? uh, okay. Uh, get, get a forum yeah. so that people can do a call and discussions and say, well, we want to have a support business, guys. I have, uh, or what, how are we going to establish this? In my preference. I mean, I, I know, I mean, I've been asked this many times, five years ago, six years ago, if you look at how other open source uh, projects evolve, especially when they get a bit bigger, you, you could decide to go like how a Canonical is working with Ubuntu, which is that you build a servicing business. So you centralize the whole project and you say, okay, the whole development of Blender will be happening on Blender Institute and we will uh, involve consultants and developers and we will hire the whole bunch, start a business with 20, 25 people, and we call that the Blender Company. I could, but I, I decided not to do that. A, because I really, c oh, well, because I don't, la I don't think I even can. I'm, I'm not a typical developer person. I'm a creative. I like to make things. My passion is in, in having Blender to work and not having coders, like 20, a whole room of coders working on Blender doesn't sound to me like a very interesting project. I want to have coders and artists to work together, right? Uh, that's that's a very, a very good approach, And but my, the, it was a question, so I, I wasn't saying what you should do, 
But now that I, uh, this is the philosophy and it's a very good one, the question is, shouldn't be somewhere in the foundation or in the institute that should kick things to the right path, not manage things, but steer them somehow, somehow. No, don't do that, he'll hate me. They are nice guys, right, but they can't do it. They're ready for it. They might be smiling and nice, but you can kick them. They are happy with it. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> but I understand the problem. And I, I think uh, a couple of years ago, when the network started, I added a little note, and probably never, nobody has ever seen it, but it said that the Blender Institute is open for support contracts by other network members. At that time, I don't, at this moment, uh, uh, I don't know, but at that time we, we did uh, two things even. We did little projects where you could hire a Blender developer to uh, be put on some job. But at the moment we don't have enough developers, we don't really need the money, of course we always need money, but we need money for our current projects, not for other projects. So that is not a, a thing that moves on, but I would still like to promote businesses who can. Like is there the Lumiku, are they here? Lumiku guys. Where are they? Jana and, okay they're not here. But this is uh, the Finnish company, there's three Blender developers in it. Uh, Nathan Ledwory is doing the integration of the Cycles engine in the uh, uh, Rhino, NURBS editor. Uh, Jana and uh, uh, he did the particles code in Blender, he did some other projects. But they both know how Blender works and they have a business. Phone them and get down the Blender network, get them to work on things. And I'm sure there are a couple of other companies already out there and who really like to be hired. Right? Who would you like to be hired as a consultant on things? You? Here? Yeah? Two? Three? Four? Of course! <laughs> ah, consultant. No, you're not for hire. You're not for hire. <laughs> you have enough to do. You see? So maybe we should start a blenderconsultant.org or something or to support this that it becomes more visible, or maybe there can be a tag at the, uh, 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 make them very prominent. Because what, what a typical consultant shop could be, is that you go to the consultant to say, okay, I've got this idea for Blender, and I want to have it in the next release. How are we going to do that? And the consultant says, aha, uh -huh, that's interesting. So we're going to do this and that, and we have to talk to that guy, and then here, and then propose a paper, and then massage a little bit of things, and do that, and then you get a feature in Blender, which you want. Or, I have a bug, and I have to, want to have it fixed within an hour, because our whole project is, who can fix this bug? Well, you need a consultant who knows all those developers, who can do some kicking, and say, ah, look at the bug now, and fix it, and get uh, 200 euros. That's what a consultant could do. That kind of things I would like you guys to think of, uh, to do. No? Uh, you told uh, yesterday about uh, Blender 101. I, is there already a strategy or starting point, mailing list or anything about that? Or, or is it just an idea for the moment? Uh, it is still only uh, a project where I want to have feedback on. There is no formal organization. I first want to know if it resonates, if people think, yeah, yeah, oh, wow, this is awesome. And then uh, mail me and I uh, know who's, who's interested. Or uh, we can talk about uh, what would you want to do. We want to have feedback, we want to be involved. We want to uh, support it, we want to develop it, we want to give it money, or we want to promote it. I want to find out where the feasibility is. Because I, I, I don't like it to start up a project with a team when I don't know if we can do it. For the moment when we announce this as a project, it will happen. Right? At the moment it's still like, uh, how do I fit it in my own busy schedules and stuff, or who's going to do it? I'm looking for a couple of people who I have 100% confidence in that they really can drive it forward. What is 101? The, the 101 project is a 
uh, there's a co couple of things, but mainly it is to make a proof of concept of a blended version which works for 12 to 14 year old kids in a high school to do something simple in Blender. So you can make such a project in Blender by configuring it. It's not a fork, it's not a special version, it's mainly uh, finishing the current interface code we have, the 2.5 project, Python APIs, designing really well systems to control all of this, and then try to kick out 99% of the features and do something like what the, the Fluid designer did yesterday, you had to talk. Okay, but there was, in Python you can already build interfaces, but it's still limited, and we want to build that a little bit further. And then you could, for example, think of making an interface with only three pictures, a picture of a monkey, a picture of a print, and a picture of a moving operation or so. And then kids can add monkeys in a 3D view and print it, or move things around, or then you add a little bit of more tools. So you need a way to create tools in Blender. And if you can do that for kids, you can also do it for animators, or for game makers, or for occasional users, or for 3D printing. I mean, I want to be more workflow oriented with Blender. That's what I was talking about. So, Tim. <coughs> but the one on one is, I want to have Blender in schools. Because education, high schools, they all want to have 3D now. And I don't want that opportunity to be only in the hands of Autodesk. They try it with 1, 2, 3D, which is the most horrible, stupid thing ever. Don't try it at home. But Blender and open source and what we can do is far more powerful. And so Blender can give kids the whole roadmap. Not only if you have a one-on-one -on -one process which is easy, but for those little two to five percent of talented kids who like it, they can remove their skin and then they make film or games or whatever they want to. And that's unbeatable. Um, uh, do you have any approximate statistics about where Blender is being downloaded and which countries it's becoming popular and how the community is developing? We always post uh, website statistics online. Um, to find out where <laughs> I tweet it and stuff. Yeah, nowadays you just tweet. Yeah, I know, that's also stupid. Yeah, you have to follow me on Twitter and then you know everything. <laughs> There's a Tom Rosendahl at Twitter. Yeah, everybody following me? Yeah. Huh? Okay. So, yes, but I post it at, if you go, I'm. Mm. Is it there? It's there! <laughs> yeah, what evidence? Can you show it on the computer when I'm talking? <laughs> so I always forget because those numbers are too big. But there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, physics on the website. It goes into the millions. <laughs> and there's uh, millions of downloads. And we, we usually stop counting because the, the statistics take too much space on the disk and stuff like that. I suppose my, the, what I really was asking was uh, where other than uh, the Netherlands is uh, a hot spot of Blender or are there any interesting communities developing that uh, you're surprised by? But the Netherlands is totally not the hot spot for the Blender. Uh, <laughs> there's one Blender user in the Netherlands, I think, maybe two, <laughs> three, four. <laughs> but Dutch people are a little bit weird, you know. We have a tiny little country. And everybody is still sitting on their own little islands. And um, if you are 10 kilometers away, this is outside of bicycle distance, <laughs> then we don't meet in our, uh, Then we say, oh, that's too far away. I don't want to talk to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could find it. Hmm? Yeah, or oh, you could show it. I'm sorry. Yeah. But you wanted to know the world map, maybe, with the statistics. Yeah, okay. it's like, because the latest, latest, the latest, greatest. So, it's um, uh, 3D and Blender is international. So if you look at uh, how uh, statistics work for visitors and users, the Netherlands is only 15,000, 15, uh, 16 million people, and uh, France is 70 million. So in France, you will find uh, ten, uh, eight times more users than in the Netherlands. That's how it goes. But it's not like we have a 
to speciously bake that blender community. We, we do have a speciously bake community in Germany. <laughs> but, uh, the blender is extremely popular there, uh, uh, more than an average. And the other is uh, Brazil. For some reason, Brazil is really, really, really blender minded. The, the oldest Blender website, aside from Blender.org or the Blender.nl at that time, is the Brazilian community website. And it's still there since 98 already. Very cool. I don't understand why that's important. I'm sitting alone in Sweden uh, on countryside and I'm connected to Andrew Price in, uh, in, in Korea and uh, I'm connected to Ton and I, I'm connected to other people so it's the, the, the advantage of Blender is that it's not, n not necessarily national anymore and of course it's nice to meet once in a while I mean, so that's what you probably mean yeah. um. Do you, what do you think of the idea to make uh, crowdfunded features? Like um, some people wish to have a uh, near functionality in Blender and they are willing to give especially money to that. If you would do that, yeah? Uh, we, we did uh, start a crowdfunded feature film in uh, April, the Gooseberry Project, you know, right? An, an, another one, or oh, that mean that kind of feature. Sorry, I missed what kind of feature. But then you have to repeat the question. But I'm totally confused. Uh, what do you think of um, if some website would make like uh, um, yeah, like crowdfunding? But that, uh, people started it several times. But you can buy a feature via. Uh, we're voting with your money, right? So you say, okay, developer says, I call this for 1,000 euros, and then you collect the money in and wait until you get it. But in, in general, if you, there's discussions in the open source communities about it. I'm on a list with uh, foundation boards and other foundations like from Mozilla to OpenOffice, um, Gnome and everybody. And they all agree on that the system totally fails. It's a really bad system. So the, you could try, uh, Google Summer of Code is a little <coughs> bit like it, so it's also a problematic system, but if you really say, okay, I have an amount of money and I want to connect that to a feature, you got a very weird dynamics, because then who says that that feature is really good? Because usually if people pay for it, it doesn't mean that it is good, right? So then you have still a team of people who then have to review the code, and then they say, yeah, but the code sucks. But, yeah, but I got paid for it, right? So, but, yeah, but it sucks. Then what? Right? So, um, this is a difficult system. So, what you need to do is to help people to make good contributions. And that is usually not something you can pay for. Not so easy. You can support, the, uh, that's why I have the Blender Development Fund, which works ten times better than uh, feature-driven funding. There is uh, three, four hundred members of the fund, and thanks to the fund, we can hire developers on bigger things. And then we know that the moment we do hire this developer, like for the freestyle project, we hire the guy for six months to finish things. And then he has time to do it, and to do something good, and we can help him make sure that what he does is ending up in Blender. Which is, I think, a better system. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, the Google Summer of Code, uh, when you mention it. Uh, do you feel it's a success? Because for me it looks like there's 10 students and we only see one of them. And how many you know, of the developers stick around and keep <coughs> contributing? It's always a bit problematic. The, uh, it did work for us really well. So there's many success cases, and I think if you look at the past year, we selected only seven 
Uh, we select, selected nine, but two of them were doubles, and they left uh, to another project. But the seven projects we did, I think three or four uh, have been or are successfully completed, but there's also three that probably are not going to be finished and are not good enough, and there's one. Mm, so, uh, yeah, does it work? Um, <coughs> for Blender, it, I mean, maybe for, uh, for projects like Krita or GIMP or uh, projects that don't have so much organization already behind it, it works much better. But they can get finally somebody paid. But for us, we already do pay like 10 people to work on Blender. So it's like, so how does it fit in then with the student? Because who's the mentoring the student? And then suddenly I have to assign Blender uh, foundation people or the people who work for the institute as a mentor on the student to work on stuff paid by Google and then Google pays them and then it doesn't end up in Blender and it's, it's, it's a bit weird. Like I don't know how much we should do that in the future. So it depends really also on the students. So some, you can't predict it either. Sometimes great people come in, like <laughs> popping out of nowhere. And we also had the fluid in Blender, thanks to uh, Google Summer of Code. And you can uh, see and the freestyle was a Google Summer of Code project. So that the many really good Google Summer of Code projects. But it's the average is like 20, 30 percent or so, I think. That's the really good ones. And maybe that's good enough, but not my money, it's Google's money. So. Um, could you give a bit of an update on what's coming out of what's happening with Red Current at the moment? Yes. So the uh, the Google, oh, sorry, the the, uh, the the Gooseberry project was started with a number of goals. So one of them was to make a good system to have many studios to collaborate. And as a code name, I had Red Current. <laughs> But at the moment, the Red Curtain project is actually Blender the Cloud. And it sounds a little bit, a little bit nicer. So there's already a product, and we are working on making sure that all those functionalities we want to be able to make a film will be there in this cloud system. So that people who have accounts there can review it and look at it and play with it. And later, hopefully, we have enough power then to give them access to other own projects. Or to put projects there and hook it up with the farms and that kind of thing. So the, good, the Red Curtain project has been funded by the European Union, and thanks to that we do have a budget to hire two or three extra developers. And they are working in the Blender Institute, and they are happily doing lots and lots of Blender work. I was wondering something. Um, with Brush now working for uh, Arnold, uh, do you think this will uh, encourage new developers to start to contribute to Blender because they, they see someone who started by making code for Blender and now is paid in one of the most advanced, I mean, no, <laughs> it's quite a big achievement for him to, and for the Blender. I, I really uh, wished, but uh, I rather would have uh, Blender break still to work for us, of course. But uh, yes, the working for Blender is a great start of your career. And uh, I know in the end, I mean, uh, the big companies have far more bigger budgets and they have bigger projects. So I really like it to see when people go to a company like uh, the Arnold project, or people go to Pixar or Google or whatever, of course they should do that. You don't have to work for Blender forever. So. So if you start as a developer with Blender, you learn things, and I'm sure that's useful in many other situations. Uh, just another question. If you have, for example, uh, made an add-on or something like this, how you can uh, get this into the trunk version or some of the trunk versions of Blender? Uh, perhaps you made an add-on or something like this for Blender, and uh, how do you get this add-on into the trunk version or something like this? I should give that to uh, Campbell. He knows everything about that. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a Python mailing list. 
and you can mail the list and ask for a review. Currently the whole system is kind of broken and not working. Um, because, because there's very, there's very, very few people who will review your add-ons. I'm one of them, but so many of the add-ons I read are such bad code and I can't go through and spend the time to go through all and explain why it's bad or why it's not acceptable. So I think we really would like to have someone dedicated to work on add-ons, add-on bug fixes, managing the community, talking to the developers, because at the moment I don't really have enough time to devote to this and it's a real pity. The, the sham is for if you have an add-on or if you have any Blender patch, we have hundreds of uh, submissions in the tracker waiting to be reviewed. And code review is not really funny. Do you like to do that? <laughs> Perhaps. Maybe we should tell people who put a uh, patch in the tracker that they first have to review 10 other patches before they are uh, going to review themselves. I don't know. We have to find a better way to get a better project running to review things like add-ons or code. But we do use Blender Development Fund money to hire people to work on the trackers. So for example, we have Bastien, Bastien Montagne, Bastien, Bastien. Look at him. He's like fixing every bug in Blender at the moment. He's really good. Thank you. And we have uh, more. And I'm talking to a couple of others, uh, young, younger developers who come in. Uh, if they seem like they understand the code, they can get uh, a nice temporary job to help fixing bugs and reviewing patches. And that's probably the only way to do it. And I'd rather give development fund money to support in a way that then people can have fun coding cool features. But for coding cool stuff, you don't have to get paid, right? You have to get paid for doing the boring stuff, like fixing bugs and reviewing. I would suggest to have there a very uh, a comprehensive um, manual for to write add-ons for, for Blender because that saves uh, a lot of um, amount for reviewing code there. It was a suggestion, a suggestion for to have a manual how to submit an add-on and how to avoid bad code. I mean the, uh, if you would like to be uh, active in the development, in the, sorry, in the documentation team, we have a doc board mailing list. It would be really good to have more people that are showing up and taking up a little bit of responsibilities for organizing uh, the other documenters. Well, that's a great idea. But ideas don't make it happen usually. So you have to find the people. So are you going to make it happen? But you are making art yourself, right? You're an artist. You don't want to be an author. First chance to have the idea there. Oh, okay. Good ideas, that's how you start. Yeah. And I have to wrap it up. I have to get my own lunch. And there's a guy looking at, hey guy, we have to stop. That's the Sherman meeting now, right? So, uh, thank you all for listening and uh, you make it. One moment. You know, um, just, um, uh, but if you want to, uh, you can't have both open. Okay. This one has to be you, or you want to go.